Good evening, Utah. My name is Zachary Moses, and I plan to be Utah's next governor. And I plan to get there by doing things that my Republican competitors would never do. And that's talk about the Great Salt Lake. A lot of us appreciate the Great Salt Lake for the natural wonder it is, and a lot of us don't. A lot of us just think of it as a salty, stinky cesspool off in the West Desert that we don't need to worry about. And we'll divert fresh water away from it so that we can use that water for more useful things like industry and agriculture and watering our lawns instead of wasting it out there in the desert. So here it is in 1989. The Great Salt Lake, beautiful, big, and blue. Look how it extends all over. Salt Lake City is down here. We've got Ogden up here, and then Logan is out there, and Brigham City, and all that stuff, all moving along this lake, our shores where we live. In 1987, Governor Banger, in order to keep the lake, which was growing in the 80s, from flooding Rose Park, Governor Banger, here on the western shores, built $60 million pumps to actually pump the excess water out here where they created the Newfoundland Evaporation Basin. So much water was pumped out that by 1989, water was starting to backflow into the Great Salt Lake, creating a whole new island. That's pretty cool. This is Antelope Island, for those of you who are familiar, which is the largest island in the Great Salt Lake. Fun fact, my wife and I actually got married at Buffalo Point right here. Most beautiful view in the world. It's actually won a bunch of awards for most epic view. Beautiful pink granite, some of the oldest stones in the entire valley. Very empty until I made this video. Go check it out, cool tourist spot. Even in the lake's current state. This is what the lake looks like today. Fully 50% of its evaporative surface is gone. That's a big deal when you consider up to 40% of our snowfall is coming from it. 50% is gone. Now, last year, the University of Utah commissioned a study, and a scientist rode to every corner of the Great Salt Lake's exposed playa, 2,300 total miles. Every 500 meters, he stopped and he took a soil sample. And this is so they could identify what was coming in the dust storms that are now being generated off the lake. And as all of you have noticed, the inversions are getting really bad here in northern Utah. Very brown, they persist for long periods. Well, BYU has actually identified that 90% of that particulate dust is actually being generated right off of this exposed playa. And to make it even scarier, 90% of the potential dust is actually locked under a salt crust. But each year that this crust remains exposed, more of that dust is coming out. So in their studies, when they were identifying the elements of concern, there were nine total, but two especially stand out. And that's asbestos, which we all know when we watch the infomercials late at night, how dangerous asbestos is for your lungs. And the other one is arsenic. Now, if you are a cancer biologist trying to stimulate lung cancer in a mouse for study, one of the easiest ways to do it is powderizing arsenic and having the mice inhale it. If you live anywhere in this region where you get touched by inversion, you're inhaling arsenic and asbestos. And there's really, according to Governor Herbert's office, nothing we can do about this except hope for snow. Just backing out a little so you can see some of the other stuff that's going on in the state here with our hydrological system. Here's Provo down here and Utah Lake, which is our largest freshwater lake in the state. See how it's bright green? Why has this been allowed? This bright green algae is super toxic. Maybe you've seen the science. If you've been to the Jordan River or the Utah Lake, all the signs that say don't eat the fish, don't do recreation in the lake. It's getting to where the majority of the year Utah Lake is not safe for recreation. I actually have a solution for this, but I'm not doing it in this video. We're gonna make a later video on that. Getting back here, out here, here's the salt flats. Water used to persist some or all of the year in the salt flats and actually going all across the I-80 corridor into the west. There are salt pans where saline lakes once persisted. Now this is massive wildlife migratory habitat. This was, this, what we're talking about, when these were full, say when pioneers arrived, or even a thousand years before that, when all of these saline lakes were full, 
Migratory birds would come in, huge amounts of food, very lush, very great place, could, could handle a lot of people through here at one time. Today, with all of the water diversion, completely dry. Totally dry. And the reason that this matters to you, it's not just the dust coming off our playa in Salt Lake. It's the entire Great Basin causing our pollution problems. And they smack into those Wasatch Mountains, mile high off the valley floor. And when they smack into that, we're just getting dust now. We're not getting the kinds of storms we should have. Here's a little science lesson for you. Out here in the Pacific Ocean, we have storms that develop. As those storms come blowing in with our prevailing winds in the wintertime, those storms smack into the Sierra Nevada mountains between California and Nevada. That's why it's so green on this western side. It's sort of, think the windward side of Hawaii. Very green, tropical forests. The leeward side, very dry, very desert. Same thing happens in this region, and we get dry. Now, historically, when we had saline water persisting in these lakes, these clouds would drop, drop most of their moisture on that western side. And the, the clouds that could make it over would get higher in altitude and carry over into the basin. Now these saline lakes would respirate salt particles into the air, which served to seed the clouds, weigh them down, and as they came down, because saline water stays liquid in the wintertime, the temperature differences allow those, lake, those clouds to pull lake effect off of all of these across the west, and it all ends up in the Wasatch Front, right here where the majority of Utah's population lives. So, these are the problems. This is what we're seeing. And here are our solutions. In our first 100 days, we are going to fund a feasibility study that goes along this I-80 established corridor, and we're going to do pumped hydro energy storage. If you don't know what pumped hydro is, pumped hydro uses two water basins to make renewable energy. You have an upper basin, like this. This one here, this is the La Muela Pumped Storage Station in Spain. It produces 1,800 megawatts of power, all by pumping water from the lower basin up this line to the upper basin when they have renewable energy in excess. Think sun is shining, wind is blowing, but we're not using that power. Well, at night, when you need power and you don't have sunshine or the wind's not blowing, you discharge water from the upper basin back to the lower basin through high energy turbines, thus creating power. Now, this small project here, this is a huge amount of power being generated off this one little pumping station. So now imagine if we followed the I-80 corridor and we did similar projects to the La Muela project, we could put our stations in each of these collapse, at the edges in the mountains on each of these collapsed lakes and actually store that salt water in the upper basin, just as easy to move salt water as it is to move fresh water. But when we discharge, we're discharging and actually restoring this collapsed ecosystem, returning it to what it once was. Now this has a lot of potential solutions to problems that we're not even considering. By putting water in each of these lakes, no more dust. That's 90% of our particulate pollution, gone tomorrow. By building pumped hydro energy batteries, we're not having to farm for lithium ion or nickel and cobalt off the ocean floor. We're not doing that damage. Concrete and steel, that's all we're after here. So not only do we get to cover these playas and clean up that air, but by moving to a renewable energy grid, we get to further reduce the pollution in our area. And the biggest caveat of all, by restoring our rain generator and putting saline water back into these lakes, we could double our fresh water stores here in the, in the Wasatch Front and possibly meet our population demand by 2050 where our population is supposed to double. So, if you want a governor who's actually going to look for solutions that will help the people of Utah, look no further than Zachary Moses. I'm your guy. I'm Zachary Moses, and I approve this message.